I think uh, that we have uh, four very good uh, presentations, and I think it sets the stage for a good uh, discussion. What I thought I would do is just uh, ask two questions to the panelists and maybe respond a bit on the India, India question. So the first question is to challenge the optimists, because these guys have done quite a bit. Uh, but, but I think just as a, to summarize the argument, essentially the Taliban thinks they're winning, so they have no incentive to be accommodative or to accept a reasonable uh, framework. Uh, Americans are losing patience uh, after 17 years, uh, one of the longest wars. So the domestic political support has eroded, so it's a matter of time how that cookie will crumble because of domestic politics, not driven by Afghan considerations, but by their own, like, as I said, great powers, finally do what is in their own interest. Third, the sanctuary problem has not been solved. Uh, in this Afghan war, the sanctuary was seen as the partner. Uh, so Pakistan was both part of the problem as well as part of the solution. And that didn't work out well. And for the Taliban, which criticizes the Afghan government as a puppet of Americans, is, some people think is actually a puppet of Pakistan. But, but that political argument one doesn't see being made. But the fact that it has sanctuaries, it has enjoyed those sanctuaries, has actually makes it, like most military historians will say, you can't defeat a, you know, an insurgency if it has a huge sanctuary next door. Uh, these are enough uh, problems there. Do you, how do you see this being overcome when you have this kind of uh, difficulties that are present? So it seems that I'm the only optimist here. Sonia can join you. <laughs> Sonia can join me a little bit, help me. Okay? Uh, because we have to be optimists since we are living in Afghanistan. I think that is, that's, that's where our future is and, and that's uh, probably why, why we are optimists. So if I have the courage of withstanding uh, or defying Hegel, uh, I think I can, do, <laughs> I can do defy some of the uh, really realistic you know, uh, analysis of what's happening. Even if I, if I let myself go on the, on the other side, I have even more uh, you know, difficult questions on how these things could, uh, could really unravel and, and what Bill said that could, you know, or, or uh, Dr. Sidney said that it will be you know, a catalyst to catastrophe because we have seen this, you know, our experiences of 1988 and then um, even 1992, the Benin Seven uh, efforts uh, will tell us that it can, it can turn that ugly. But why I'm an optimist is because I believe that the circumstances uh, has changed uh, the, the situation in and around Afghanistan has changed. It's not 1998, uh, and it's not uh, 1992. Um, the things, the regional dynamics uh, has shifted quite uh, uh, differently. Uh, we were at the uh, sort of end of the Cold War, and then we were actually at the beginning of the new era of unipolarism, 1992, when everybody around the world were busy. And Afghanistan was a case, the, 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 the Russians, the Soviet Union thought that it's lost. Uh, so the Americans thought that it's, you know, it was a side event of, or side effect of many other uh, conflicts uh, uh, that they had with, you know, uh, as part of the Cold War, and it's won, so they don't need to be engaged there, and then they outsource it to Pakistan at that point, which we are going towards something like this if, if it's not taken care of properly again. So there, Afghanistan was not very important, so the Berlin Wall was more important, you know, the situation of Europe was much more important, and in the region, India was not India of today, Iran was busy with something else, Russia, uh, which turned later on to be the supporter of Northern Alliance, had its own, you know, uh, uh, problems, internal problems in the 90s, you know, their own domestic issues. I remember that the forces which were fighting the Taliban, the Northern Alliance, they used to actually even buy, even purchase uh, the AK-47 ammunition from, um, from, uh, from Russia, but that's not that Russia today. So, so there, I think uh, there are two sources which makes me, you know, more optimistic that the region has changed, and, and Afghanistan, the people of Afghanistan, in the past 17 years, Sonia was talking about uh, uh, a civil society uh, uh, in a youth group, and all the achievement, the gains, some small level of uh, peace dividend that we have had. Yes, it's not all over Afghanistan. Not all the Afghan people are feeling the same. There are areas, there are people that they are really, you know, uh, suffering from scourges of this war, the civilian casualties. So it's this, this not equal distribution of it. But again, we have a generation like myself and, and, and so 
Estonia and uh, Farhonda and a few others who are here, they were a generation of, oh, yeah, we have the experience of the Taliban. We remember when Dr. Najibullah was hanged. But again, we have seen the past 18 years. They are gains. They are uh, tremendous gains that we had in the past uh, 18 years. And, and we believe that even the Taliban, when they are putting their position as an insurgent, we have all this literature of you know, these peace talks, they will go maximum. They have a maximalist approach. Their stated position, we believe in, as again the diplomats, that their stated position is much different from their actual position. If, if we can all stay together, stick together, and, and, and keep this process, keep this negotiation going on up to a level where uh, some sort of you know, a, a, a peace agreement which will have the element of sustainability. We are not talking about other cases like you know, what, what are the elements of a sustainable peace is reached. Uh, at, at least what we hear from the Taliban. I, know, I don't know if that is, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of articles which say the Taliban has not changed. I mean, if you, uh, but I will say that they will change and they have to change because it's not 1996 that they, will they can drive into Kabul and then everybody will cheer for them because Ka Afghanistan was suffering for a, a civil war at the time. People were deceived by the Taliban's, you know, all these uh, nice words that they will come and will clear all these warlords and then we will bring the king or somebody. So now people know the real face of the Taliban. If we accept the Taliban, if we wanted to talk with them, if we wanted to negotiate, or have some sort of power sharing is not with blind or closed eyes. We know what they are, and we are thinking that you know if they integrate, we have question of reconciliation and integration. If they can integrate in this in the society, I think there isn't a space for them, and they can slowly uh, will turn into a political force. So the important thing is, what are those steps? Is our system ready to integrate the Taliban? So, but again, I believe there might be a crisis, but uh, they always change demands crisis. So if you want to bring change, that change happens when you have a crisis, so there is an opportunity in it. And, and again, it depends on the, I believe, in the wisdom of the Afghan people and also on the lessons that we all learn uh, from, you know, from our region. We know the, uh, the consequence of a failure. Neither India nor you know, Central Asia nor Iran, Pakistan even to that extent, cannot afford a catastrophe, uh, you know, uh, a failure which the impact will be much harsher and harder on everybody, including you know, the, the, the refugees, including the, all these you know, terrorist groups which can come in. So I'm believing that, that there is an opportunity, but it's not like it's going to happen uh, tomorrow or the day after. The Irish, I think, uh, 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 process, which of course we had a strong government, the, uh, the, the UK there, uh, it took around six, 76 years, I think the same for Colombia. So I, we don't have that much time, but still, I think this process could go on, and, and, and we will uh, reach peace. Thank you. Um, sure. <laughs> well, one thing that um, uh, I, I keep thinking, I, I, many times I put myself in the position of Taliban, and I'm, I'm thinking, uh, uh, you know, uh, Taliban have had their, their fame, their leverage, through violence um, throughout this, uh, the, the past 17 years. They started in different ways until, you know, becoming, uh, so, so literally they, they started just, you know, becoming really obnoxious, scary, uh, like a bad, really a horrible uh, dream, nightmare, literally nightmare. That's where they're bringing their leverage. That doesn't sell in today's Afghanistan. There's no way for them to actually be able to, to maintain themselves in that manner and stay relevant and respond to, to the needs of the, today's government. Even if the Taliban came to actually take the entire power, yes, we hear a lot of, uh, usually the headlines say a lot of bad things about um, uh, you know, the corruption and all of that, but Sir, we have a lot of sophisticated machineries. Um, I mean, I wonder who from the Taliban side would be able to actually come and run our finance ministry. Or Ministry of Rural and Rehabilitation Development with all the, the complicated and, and uh, uh, different work and different mechanisms and things that they have. So, so I don't think, you know, Taliban would have to eventually, you know, the thing is at this point, yes, you're right, we're not, 
uh, in addition to trusting others and not trusting others, basically we are really trying to focus at what we have and what we can make sense of it. And for me, the thing is that the Taliban would have to come in some form of a power sharing. Thanks. Let me switch sides like a warlord and uh, ask, uh, challenge the pessimism that was expressed so strongly. Uh, now, you know, we can all be critical of Trump, but uh, in some ways, uh, like what is done vis-a-vis -vis China, and I think uh, surprising people with the kind of resolve that you've not normally expected. And if you go back to the original South Asia policy, which is really an Afghan policy, uh, there was a recognition that the source of the problem was in Pakistan, that they're willing to put pressure on Pakistan. Now, so is that possible that this would continue in some form or the other? With, with, even after withdrawal, is it possible that if they really go for the sanctuary issue, they could actually create a very different condition. Second, uh, that putting more direct pressure on the Taliban, right now there's been a very delicate attempt at dealing with them. Uh, they were never bombed better. They never dealt with the source on the other side. Like Karzai, while he was critical of the Americans, he was also saying the problem is on the other side of the border. So if the US, with all its, you know, even with the limited residual capabilities, that if it targets the Taliban, you could create divisions, just as they created divisions on this side, you could still uh, create a structural division on the, on the, on the other side. And, and finally, that there are people who have benefited from, and purely from a structural argument, that is not the same Afghanistan. There's enough of wealth and power to be distributed, and not to be others coming and distributing it. So people are going to fight back that it is not going to be a walkover for the Taliban. Therefore, they could be the way these pieces might fall. Uh, need not necessarily be a complete disaster, but one, a rearrangement uh, which could still leave some hope, cautious, very limited, very residual, very slim possibility of rearranging it in a better way than we had. So both of you, very briefly. One of the interesting things about the Trump administration was that in August 2017, President Trump gave a speech about Pakistan's role in Afghanistan, which hit all the necessary points. It was actually very realistic, very accurate, and briefly encouraging for people who were looking for a fundamental revision of the approach to meddling in Afghanistan that had prevailed predominantly under the administration of President George W. Bush, but then with some continuity under President Obama's administration. Unfortunately, I think much of the force of that rhetoric has been dissipated by the uh, eagerness to become involved in direct negotiations with the Taliban, because it's, uh, it, uh, it sends a mixed and confusing signal about what the objective of uh, the, the White House actually is in these circumstances. And that is then augmented by the plethora of other information coming out about policy making in this particular White House that doesn't inspire one with confidence that the policy process is a measured or reasoned one that is likely to apply particular measures in a consistent fashion in order to achieve a particular outcome. I, I've never in my life seen an, administ an American administration that has even approached the kind of quixotic character that this one does and uh, there seems to be no understanding on the part of the president that every tweet that he puts out potentially has an audience of hundreds of millions of people down, uh, throughout the world who will uh, put an interpretation on it and this is precisely why historically the process for presidential statements has been such a laborious one in which different agencies of the state have had appropriate input in order to determine that signals that come from such a, uh, an important source are uh, uh, transmitted with the maximum possible clarity. So I think there's a major difficulty now because of the incoherence of the signalling uh, that's come from the White House and that has really undermined the uh, potential effect of the uh, positive uh, signalling that came with the August 2017 uh, speech. Uh, I do think there's a, a deeper problem 
uh, indebted with Pakistan, obviously. It's, it's a nuclear armed state. It's one on which the United States has been dependent for logistical s support of its forces in Afghanistan for a very long period of time. But um, uh, Pakistan has itself shown great skill in exploiting the fear of internal collapse in Pakistan to creating a fundamentalist regime with a bomb as a way of minimising pressure on it through diplomatic channels. Uh, and uh, there are more instruments available to the United States to bring pressure to bear on Pakistan in respect of sanctuaries than have been used. But I, I think the fear now, or the problem, is that in um, Islamabad there's no great apprehension that these kinds of measures are going to be used in any kind of fashion, and that then undermines the, uh, the prospects for a, a effective implementation of the, the kind of measures that were perhaps foreshadowed in the August 2007 speech. Thank you. Uh, David, any? Well, I would agree with you that if the United States were to take those additional actions against uh, regarding Pakistan that you described, uh, that would be a, that would change things. Uh, but I definitely agree with Mr. Mali that there's no evidence that the United States will go any further than it did the height of the U.S. sanctions uh, on Pakistan were early 2018, and uh, they have essentially been uh, the U.S. has been pulling back from those, uh, and there's a belief in the administration that Pakistan is doing enough uh, so that there's not likely to be stronger sanctions, uh, and so I don't think you're going to see any of that kind of, uh, of, of actual um, uh, new initiatives by the United States, such, certainly no major one of going after uh, the, the, the sanctuaries with any kind of with military force, something that a number of people in the U.S. has advocated over the last 20 years, which, which we've never done, for exactly the, the, the fears that uh, Professor Mali said about the, dis the, fall the disintegration of Pakistan and the falling uh, into, uh, into terrorist or other hands, fundamentalist hands of the uh, Pakistanis' nu nuclear weapons and materials. Um, on, the, uh, uh, on the issue of, uh, of a peace, uh, and uh, to today, I, I was watching on, on TV, saw the celebrations of uh, Anzac Day, and I know that Australia is one of the sponsors here, and the, uh, a lot of the discussion was about the end of the First World War. The First World War ended with the so-called Versailles Peace Treaty, but the Versailles Peace Treaty was actually a recipe for war. Uh, the result of the Versailles Peace Treaty was a war that killed millions of people and ended uh, in 1918, uh, short, uh, 21 years later. A war began uh, that Versailles laid the basis for that killed tens of millions of people. A bad peace treaty can be a, a disaster. And that's what I'm concerned about here. I would like to share the optimism of Ambassador Indisha and Sonia Iqbal. I hope that they're right. Uh, unfortunately, my current analytical view is that's not as likely as it should be, and I hope I'm wrong. Just briefly on the India issue, and then we'll go to the floor. But the question you raised, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very good one. And uh, I believe the last time President Trump met Prime Minister Modi, he actually confronted him with this question. Right? Uh, You're next door. What are you doing? And he's kind of uh, trolled, uh, shall we say, Mr. Modi, by saying, look, oh, India is doing great stuff. They're building a library. So uh, is that so it's really? Parliament. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't matter. So yeah. facts are not uh, issue. But basically, saying you're next door. Why aren't you doing more? You should be the one actually chipping in. After all, uh, India security has been most deeply affected. But I think there is a history here for Indians. It is a surprising question. It is the government people, because the advice from the Americans through 2000s was stay away. Uh, because Pakistan gets upset, you, they don't like you, they don't like the sight of you. I believe you have 100 consulates when you had just four. So just, just you know, stay away from the security stuff. And for the Indians, it was convenient as long as the Americans were willing to fight till the last American, uh, you were happy doing economic development. But the fact is, that's not going to be possible in the new situation. Therefore, I think India is going to be confronted with the situation that uh, it, the present government is doing a little more than the previous one to give some military assistance. But I think that question will come to haunt India. Because uh, if the Americans leave, then the ball is going to come back squarely to how the region is going to deal with, with this problem. So I think it's, it's a matter of time. And if the US leaves, and I think India's own capabilities have increased, and the security threats for India from terrorism are so large. So I would say 
uh, it is going to be a, a dynamic work in progress, and, and I won't go by what's happening today. Yeah, yeah I, if I could just add to that. Uh, I think David mentioned the possibility of significant numbers of, re uh, maybe Sonia, the significant numbers of refugees flying out of Afghanistan and the perception is that things have gone bad. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that when the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan in circumstances where the Geneva Accords were pretty plainly just a veil to cover a humiliating retreat, uh, this stimulated a rhetoric worldwide amongst jihadist groups to the effect that the lesson of that experience was that um, religion was a force multiplier that could defeat even a superpower. There is, I think, a grave danger that similar things could happen if the perception at the end of the day is that the United States and its allies uh, have retreated without success from their involvement in Afghanistan. Uh, there's also, I think, a specific danger for India, which is that a group such as Lashki Toiba, based in Pakistan, might be emboldened by such a spectacle to think at an opportune moment to attempt another attack in India of the kind that we saw in Mumbai in November 2008. And if were that to happen, I'd be glad to be living in the southern hemisphere. So I think we've got about uh, 25 minutes uh, to uh, for questions. So I think there was so much of a stimulating discussion. I'm sure uh, many of you have questions. So maybe we'll take uh, two or three at a time and then come back. Uh, to you. Anyone there? Mr. Chaudhary, you're... I'm going to ask Iqbal after that. Okay. Should I move to the... No, no, yeah, very well. Which is... Uh, thank you, Professor. I mean, it was an extremely stimulating discussion, of course, and uh, um, uh, we learned a lot. And uh, we have uh, very key players uh, on this stage, and we are grateful for giving us the time. I have uh, this is with uh, regard to uh, uh, something that Professor uh, Akbal said towards the end. And if I understood you your right, your thesis was that we still don't have the issues in place. By the way, my name is Iftikhar Chaudhary. I originally am from Bangladesh. I'm a, a, a fellow at the institute here. But I used to be a Bangladeshi diplomat and then uh, in the cabinet. But uh, and I've been involved with Afghanistan for a long, long time, since the Soviet, uh, this thing. And we were involved with the first negotiations. Um, uh, your point that the issues are not in place, and therefore we don't have the factors necessary for the negotiations to commence effectively. I, uh, I thought that was the thrust of your, your thesis. I entirely agree with you. I uh, will make a comment on this, and I'd uh, uh, invite you to react to it. I also like to think that we don't have the, not only that we don't have these issues in place, we don't even have the protagonists in place. We have uh, the, uh, the Americans, of course, and we have the Taliban's very identifiable. We have what is now called the wedding party from, from, from Kabul, uh, the gov representatives of the government of Kabul, and the emerging voice of what used to be called the silent voice, the voice of the emigrants, the, the migrants in Europe, in Europe. Uh, uh, Bob is right that there was a time when, when we had this huge uh, millions of refugees in Pakistan. But these European Afghan, uh, Afghans play a slightly different role, and the thrust is a little different. Uh, they, uh, uh, if I have my facts right, they met Stanigzai three days ago. And uh, they, uh, they dealt with the uh, issue of the women. Uh, women's issues, should the Taliban come to place? And it gives one the impression that already the, uh, 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 the idea is that, I mean, they are coming, and you might as well uh, relax and enjoy, uh, that kind of thing. So am I right in believing that we don't have the protagonists in place? And first, we have to get the process and the procedure right, and then we move to substance. Am I right in saying that? Thank you. Uh, Igba? Yeah, I just um, two two quick questions. One is um, I didn't hear anything about just introduce yourself. Okay. Ah, I'm Iqbal Sevilla from ISS, visiting scholar. Um, I, I just had two brief questions. One, um, ISIS or from ISIS? ISIS. It's your South, not ISIS. <laughs> we have another ISIS in Singapore as well, Southeast Asia still, not from that. <laughs> it's your South Asian studies, yeah. Um, I didn't hear anything about the TAPI pipeline. I'm curious about the pipeline actually helping to normalize the Taliban. When the Taliban was actually in power, 
one of the issues that they always complained about was India in particular didn't want to deal with them in the economic sectors, in trade matters. Um, I'm curious about this because this, for my view, it implicates Pakistan as well. Pakistan has a desperate need for natural gas. Is, is Pakistan, does Pakistan have a stake to bring some sort, bring the Taliban to the table, um, in opposed to their normal policies towards the Taliban actually which is supporting them, but in this case, normalizing them somewhat to have actually come to the peace table. So, so I'd like to hear a little bit about that. The other thing, just a quick point. Uh, um, with regards to the Taliban, one curious thing about them um, is that they don't have a concept of a fixed political structure. When they came to power, they said that they are willing to adapt to any political structure. They don't have an Islamic ideal in terms of politics that they go back to. So I'm just curious if, if you know, we, we talk about is, has the Taliban changed? Are they willing to adapt to new political structures in the coming years? I just want to throw that up. I think there are three very good uh, questions. I, mean, I think one is the process and the structure and the politics. That Does process come first or the politics will set the terms for the, for the process? Second, I think, is there any economic incentive? I mean, is the on the optimist side of the argument that the prospect for benefit, and you mentioned it briefly, the distributional gains. So is there an economic dimension that could make it work, uh, whether it's oil pipelines, whether it's the Chinese money, uh, Chinese are going to bring in the whole Belt and Road can now move from Pakistan and encompass Afghanistan as well. Uh, everybody can be happy with the game changer. Uh, so is there an economic structure way of changing things? And lastly, the point you made about, I mean, the Taliban, uh, can it actually, does it have a theory of governance? And from what we saw last time, when you moved to Kandahar, there was very little. So is that possible that without that, can they really administer and govern the question that you have posed? Shall we start from this side? I mean, you know. uh, thank you so much uh, for the question. I think it's really, really important. Yes, unfortunately, we're, we're not, uh, um, we don't have the elements in place and we're not ready both as a process and, you know, the uh, stakeholders, um, internal, regional, internationally. Um, it's still actually one of the things that really um, bring more anxiety uh, is sort of a chaotic situation when it comes to the issues of peace process. Uh, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of discussions, but um, given that in the past nine months there have been all of these rushed processes, no matter how much people, um, even I mean I can say um, uh, very um, uh, confidently from the uh, aspect of the civil society, no matter how much you try to be proactive about these things, something else happens that you know makes you go back to the reactive mode and just you know react to whatever is happening and whatever discussions are happening because um, it's just sort of it's upon us and and there's not much at this point that we have in terms of uh, um, you know a driving force in it. Um, uh, our government is uh, sidelined from all the discussions. In fact, even today, again, there's another discussion in Moscow to which we are not uh, a party. Um, and uh, uh, we've had a few efforts towards uh, developing a roadmap, um, but that frankly wasn't uh, well prepared because we didn't have the right, you know, enough time and enough, you know, discussions around it. Uh, so um, we're still lacking in terms of the process. Um, again, uh, my optimism would come as in uh, we're looking forward to next week the Loya Jirga, the Ground Council. Um, I think you know something that is really, really important is that uh, what people really want um, is going to come in, in some kind of a framework there. Uh, that that would be documented, and uh, we hope to take it. Uh, and and I think that's how it's going to be, not only for the government, for everyone else to actually take whatever comes from the Lujerga as, you know, basically the main thing, the main uh, driving force towards the peace process to develop uh, our efforts and actions around that. Uh, I will. <coughs> Probably go a little bit in details, Mr. Uh, Chaudhary, Ambassador Chaudhary, that that I think, you know, as uh, uh, someone within the government, that there is an agenda. 
the agenda is there, the agenda is very clear, and the agenda is not something uh, hidden. I think it's generic agenda of any peace process, especially uh, when the situation is uh, like what we are at. Um, the problem is not with the agenda, the problem is with the sequencing. Uh, and what should come first, and then how that follow, and then who guarantees this sequencing uh, of these things to you know to uh, to be put together. Um, and then the if uh, the game is two levels, two level game theory. It's one is uh, the United States, you know, also in behalf of everybody else, NATO, with the Taliban, to the extension also with Pakistan, which is about the withdrawal and the uh, severing link with the Al-Qaeda, uh, and then a ceasefire. So I think these three things are what Ambassador Khalilza is talking about, and, and as uh, I think Bell said, that you know, uh, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. But I think there is some agreement <laughs> on these three uh, at some level. There will be a withdrawal. Uh, United States has mentioned this, and even there was some premature announcement by, I think, somebody leaked it or whatever from Defense Department that 50% uh, will be withdrawn by next six months, something like this. So I think those things are uh, those things are clear. Uh, so the level two, which is the, the real part of the negotiation, it's when uh, there is a negotiation between the Taliban and the Afghan government, and if I call it Afghan state, which make the umbrella larger, or even the post-state uh, uh, entities, political parties, uh, presidential candidates, civil society, the Afghan women, that 250, uh, which uh, 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 was, uh, you know, the Taliban made fun of it, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's legitimate, because the people who have stakes in this is probably the number should be even larger than this. It's not only the government uh, cabinet, but also all the political parties. I told you we have now, we are in the, in the election season itself. Right now we have 20, 18 or 20, uh, uh, 18 presidential candidates. Each team has the vice presidents, you know, and now some of them are even their chief executives. All these people, they, they feel that they are stakeholders. The women group, the civil society, um, um, former jihadi leaders. So all of them, if you put them together, it would make it 250 even more than that. So I think that is that stage of the real stage of negotiations will start at that point. So the worry, I mean, the, the question of sequence is that, that if United States and NATO will make that withdrawal conditional to an agreement between these two groups, the Taliban on one side and the Afghan state, the poorest elements on the other, I think that will give us, that will lead to some sort of peace agreement. And who will guarantee? I think that's a very difficult question. I think some countries, there was some discussion about you know, a force uh, comprised of the you know, countries of the OIC, uh, the European Union has came with a five-point uh, program, which even offered uh, 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 Commissioner Mogherini said that the EU is is ready to guarantee. I don't know which shape of kind of guarantee will come out of that, but still, I think there are things are coming together in this uh, 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 in this idea of of a negotiation. The sheer fact that the Taliban are entering into this, and the sheer fact that they, they they believe now that they cannot win, they cannot monopolize. The power in Afghanistan, and if they do, they will face a resistance even harder and harsher and more difficult than what they faced in the 1990s. Because these forces, at that time, it was only you know, Commander Massoud with few other people, and they were also in retreat. Right now, that's not the case. Yes, there will be chaos, but a chaos which will be even more difficult on areas that they are controlling. You're talking about the, the other groups of the Afghan minorities. They might even get together to make a strong force to, to fight and, and to resist the Taliban, which is not a, probably you know, a, a very uh, 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 optimistic uh, situation for Pakistan to, to hope for. The problem, you know, with the other question about the, uh, the TAPI and all this, you know, with TAPI, yes, there is, you know, it's going on. It's, it's probably more advanced as a project than, than any time before. It started in the 90s. Some people in Afghanistan, we were kids at the time. We believed that even the Taliban were a force uh, created just to secure the TAPI. You know, that was part of the conspiracy at the time, or maybe there is some, some truth in it is that if the idea of Pakistan is to bring a friendly, so-called friendly force in Kabul to secure their interest, I think that has been a mistake always. 
because in the Pakistan, that the idea of a strategic jet, which you really confronted, you know, many of uh, uh, Pakistani diplomatic colleagues, that the best strategic dip for you would be to work with the government, with an elected government in Kabul. I think there are lots of people, you know, in Kabul, that they are from the former Mujahideen. They have very good connection with Pakistan, and they, what you know, they have uh, 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 the character, but at the same time, you know, the wisdom to know how to work with Pakistan. So, if Taliban are forced to brought in to secure Tapi, I think they will be, they will be counter to that. So, and and, and Pakistan is better for Pakistan to work with the government. The last point was about the political, and this very valid question. I think I, I asked this question from one of the uh, uh, former Taliban representatives, that what kind of political entity or polity, you know, as a state they are looking? Because Islamic Emirate is not acceptable, neither to us nor to, uh, maybe the kind of Emirate which is the United Arab Emirate, that would be a better, you know, <laughs> uh, model where you have Dubai, you have Abu Dhabi and all these places. But, I asked one of them, I said, like, which kind of, uh, you know, there won't be an emirate, and this guy said, it won't be an emirate. So which kind of government do you want? Because now we have a number. There are examples from, from Saudi Arabia to Indonesia. So what is uh, your, your model? He says something between Saudi and Indonesia. I said, between Saudi and Indonesia is Iran, OK? So uh, geographical. I said, no, 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 not like Iran. But I said, today, right now, at least with the people that we spoke, they don't have an idea about this. That's why the negotiation will be very difficult, because they have this fear that since they are not ready, Sonia said that who will be the finance minister. Of course, that's a fear. They will think that, look, you know, we are not ready to go in a negotiation uh, and talk about the details. That's why they are now sticking to the general things. We want women's rights. Yes, of course, they are talking with women. Uh, of course, I don't, I, you know, don't take that uh, few people coming from Europe very uh, uh, um, seriously. Uh, they will say, we will respect women's rights, but according to Sharia. Then somebody in the negotiation team should be from our side. That's why we put 250 to confront them on the interpretation of Sharia and women's role. If you take, you know, if you go even to, to the beginning of Islam, Prophet Muhammad's wife, First, and the, the other one, Khadija and Aisha, both of them are very active women, very active. They were actually they were leading battlefields. So some Taliban, the former chief justice of Taliban, say, like, you know what? A woman can be a prime minister, but not a president. Can be a judge, but not you know, the, the chief justice. So you see, they're coming closer. So I think if the process keeps going on, and if you bring them to different venues, and if you tell them that, look, this is not 1996, you have to choose from this, uh, uh, these options that is in front of you in terms of governance, Islamic State failed. The idea of Khilafah, the idea of empire, Islamic empire has failed. Some people are still sticking to this, but Taliban understand that this is a precondition for them to, to accept the nation state. And on that, they have few models around the world. And to me, as an ambassador to Geneva, that's a very serious discussion, that what will happen to transitional justice? What's going to you know, happen to all these uh, conventions, all the laws, the rules, international treaties that Afghanistan has ac you know, acceded to, including the room charter on, on this uh, ICC? So it's not like you know, they will come and they, they could undo it. So there is huge things. And they understand this is very sophisticated, the machinery. Although it looks chaotic from outside, but inside Afghanistan, once they enter, they have to face everybody, including us. So they have to convince me, convince Sunia, and most of other Afghans that they should be uh, ru running uh, this country. Thank you. Uh, you want to come in, Bob? On the issue of pipelines, we've been here before. In the late 1990s, I wrote an article called The Perils of Pipelines that came out in the world today in London, which made the point that pipelines need to be understood as a source of rentier income and therefore potentially as a lure into a resource curse for a state such as Afghanistan. There was a very naive kind of rhetoric which floated around in the late 1990s saying, well, if you can secure Afghanistan and have oil and gas pipelines to the country, this will generate income which will allow the reconstruction of Afghanistan and it will be a win-win situation. In fact, there was a much greater prospect that that such revenues would have been a stake over which different groups in um, uh, an era of state fragility would be uh, struggling to exercise control and dominion. 
and that I think is uh, a risk that hasn't been sufficiently factored into discussions at the moment. The, the circumstances are not identical with what they were in the late 1990s, I'm not suggesting that by any means, but the fundamental problem of absorptive capacity of uh, substantial revenues from uh, this kind of rentier source uh, is still a serious one that confronts Afghanistan as well as other states. On the issue of willingness to adapt to new political structures, this is a really interesting question because the Taliban have never been very precise uh, in identifying what they want in terms of political structures, but they have been precise in identifying what they don't want. And what they don't want are pluralistic structures or democratic structures. And they've had a lot to say critically about the uh, kind of environment of constitutional structure that exists uh, at present. And that, I think, should be a source of concern. When they talk about women's rights, those statements are invariably qualified with some kind of observation about an Islamic framework or Sharia, which, of course, refers in their thinking to their conception of Sharia or an Islamic framework, which may be quite eccentric compared to what scholars in uh, most parts of the Muslim world would see as potentially relevant to that kind of interpretation. And I don't read in that any suggestion that they're moving away uh, dramatically from what they were in the late 1990s when they were by a wide march and the least feminist movement in the world, which caused them a lot of international political trouble. And that leads me to one other point I'd like to make. Uh, if one looks at the current discussions up to this point, um, some have not been all that alarmed by the exclusion of the Afghan government, but I have, for the following reason, that the mere fact of the Afghan government having been hitherto excluded from the negotiations is not without political consequences. It has the effect of delegitimating the standing of the Afghan government at the same time that the direct conversation between the Taliban and the United States are boosting the standing of the Taliban. And both of these have political consequences on the ground uh, in Afghanistan. And the thing that is most notable to me of all these discussions is that thus far the Taliban have not actually conceded a single point of any significance uh, towards the other side in the negotiations. They haven't actually made a single concession which uh, those observing the negotiations from an Afghan perspective could look at and say, this is concrete, this is binding, this is something that uh, makes it absolutely clear that they have changed fundamentally from what they were in uh, the 1990s. On the contrary, they have made uh, verbal statements in areas where anyone could get away with saying it, that they won't allow Afghanistan to be a base for terrorist attacks against the United States. Well, when I hear that, I'm reminded of Claudius's comments in Hamlet. Um, my words go up, my thoughts remain below, words without thoughts never to heaven go. Yeah. On the uh, Tappy pipeline uh, back in the 90s, uh, Henry Kissinger spoke to the uh, Unical uh, board on this, and he said it was the greatest example of hope over experience that he had ever seen. Uh, I would say that it, the Tappy pipeline remains in exactly that situation, and we can talk about the Turkmenistan and the ability of Turkmenistan to produce the gas. Uh, and, and as far as I can tell, Tappy is a, is a chimerical thing that it has no reality to it, even though when you land at the airport in Kabul, there's a big uh, uh, billboard that talks about Tappy is the hope. Uh, unfortunately, there's no reality there right now. Uh, in terms of economic drivers for peace, the Taliban apparently have indicated an interest in continued assistance from uh, from international bodies, including uh, it, it, including states. The Europeans and others have uh, have pledged a, a large amount of uh, aid to Afghanistan, which in the, in the in the context of a peace settlement could be available. But then you get into the issue of values. Uh, because it's very unlikely that any of that aid will be available if 
in a government, the Taliban, take the same approach to women that they took uh, in the 1990s. And if, again, if you listen to what the Taliban say, not what people hope, but what they say, they say essentially that they will treat the woman the same way they did before, because the way they did treated women in the 1990s was according to Sharia law, and nothing has changed. Uh, if that happens, then I don't see much prospect of that kind of economic aid being a lever, uh, a lever for peace. Uh, finally, um, the, uh, going back to the catalyst for, uh, for disaster, what's happened as a result of this, of, of the way the peace talk, of the way the peace talks in Doha have been carried on, is it's created even broader fissures in Afghan society than were there before. So yes, there will be a lawyer jirga. But the uh, chief executive officer, the really the most important number two politician, presidential candidate, uh, someone I have great admiration for, Dr. Abdullah, has said he won't partic be participating in that. Uh, one of the, the other leading presidential candidates, Hani Fatmar, said he will not be participating in that. A number of other presidential candidates will not be participating. So yes, there will be a peace jirga, but will the result be something that represents Afghanistan enough to bring into peace talks with the Taliban, that remains to be seen. Now, maybe that'll all change in the next few days, and the peace jirga will be a coming together. But so far, what at least what I have seen is the peace talks are driving Afghans further apart from each other rather than bringing them together. Uh, I think, that, and I think that is in many ways due to the inept nature of the American diplomacy that has been involved here. Can you say something on China? Uh, does both Kabul and uh, Pakistan, Taliban, I've talked about China's BRI. You see that as any role? Um, there's been talk about that, but if you look at the way BRI is being implemented, uh, China has a parallel um, um, initiative with Pakistan called the China-Pakistan Economic Co uh, Corridor, which predated BRA and has been sort of sort of absorbed into BRA, but is separate. Um, originally, uh, the original design of that was to go into many of the frontier areas of Pakistan and to try and provide economic drivers to reduce terrorism. Uh, as a result of negotiations between the two countries, the locus of the PAC projects in Pakistan shifted uh, to the east uh, and uh, have really remained there. Uh, just recently, uh, another project uh, that would have gone into the federally administered tribal area, or the former federally administered tribal areas in Pakistan, was canceled uh, because of disagreements between the Pakistani and Chinese governments. So. While there are uh, hopes that that will take place, the actual projects that are being implemented in Pakistan uh, and in other countries uh, don't right now bring any major economic or, or really any significant economic benefit to Afghanistan. But that, of course, could change. Is anyone else? Uh, Marvin, you want to say something? Oh, there. OK. Mustafa. So maybe we'll take one more, and then we're already beyond time. So yeah, I'll take it. I'll keep it brief. Huh? Very brief. Uh, First, I thank you very much for your enriching and insightful presentations. I think it's very timely and important because I think not many of us in the region of Southeast Asia are absolutely familiar and aware of what's happening in Afghanistan. And as we are in Southeast Asia, uh, is there a role for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN for short, in contributing to the peace building or peace initiative in Afghanistan, or individual countries in Southeast Asia contributing to that peace effort. I ask this in light of uh, the visit by Indonesian President Jokowi last year, where he offered a peace initiative plan, and also Singapore contributing to Singapore Cooperation Program in terms of uh, development expertise and technical cooperation. Or put differently, if I may, what lessons uh, can Afghanistan draw from ASEAN and whether it's regional cooperation, community building, conflict resolution, um, you know, contributing towards this peace effort. Thank you. Yeah, the, yeah. the last question then we'll, uh, is there? Uh, okay, I'll come to you. Hi, my name is Amim. I'm from the Middle East Institute. Two very short questions. One is, um, you guys spoke about um, the talks of uh, increasing role of Taliban in the political process, but what about their role in the military? Um, if it's true that they've been somebody who's known to work with violence and who's known in uh, work best in a in a war economy, then is there room for them to take on the sort of some some more positions in the military? Is that one of the uh, 
uh, discussion point. And the second question is uh, about uh, this problem of, I, I mean, I realize that the, of closing the border and sort of closing of the sanctuary is essential to peace building. Uh, but how does that work together with the goal of bringing some of the refugees back? So if you're bringing refugees back from Pakistan and you at the same time have to close off the border, are those two in tension with each other? How do you screen like sort of this infiltration of, of, of you know, whatever political intrigue from ISI and then so on? So, yeah, two quick Thanks. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Abdul Basis from RSIS. So, what I have understood from uh, the four presentation and the discussion is that politically, the Taliban are not ready to be part of the mainstream in Afghanistan. Um, mentally and emotionally, the Afghan intelligentsia and the elite are not ready to accept them. Of course, there are emotions, a lot of bad blood, there is a war, understandable. Now, the Afghan mainstream is so narrow and fragile that even if the, the Taliban were thrusted or accommodated into that, I believe it would just collapse. So, uh, Afghan peace process is messy, it is rough, it is chaotic, yes, but then how do you do the course correction, uh, something on that. Uh, I'm from Pakistan, so last point here about the sanctuaries has been said. Uh, things have evolved, as the ambassador said. Situation in the region has changed. So the question of sanctuaries in Pakistan has moved beyond Pakistan. You have to look into Iran as well, uh, areas like Mashhad, Karman, etc. You have to look into Russia as well, uh, China as well maybe. Uh, of the record discussion which the Chinese people have done with the Taliban, what are those, have to look into that as well. So singling out Pakistan may be the right political noise, but I think the way situation has evolved may be a bit oversimplistic, something that could be looked into last point. Uh, uh, as you know, there is this perception that the government in Kabul is uh, handpicked by the US and they only are the so-called puppets of them. That's not the case. We have seen so many people in Kabul talking against the US. Same goes for the Taliban. They would only listen to Pakistan as far as their interest is served. And wherever that interest bends, they would look the other way. That's all. Thank you. No puppets, so many agencies. Yeah. So what we're going to do is uh, we'll go back to the four panelists in a reverse order that we started and uh, that will bring this discussion to a close. We'll start with uh, David. And add any thoughts uh, to the questions as well. Okay, um, I'll, I'll leave to others uh, to, um, to a potential role, or to any specifics on a potential role for ASEAN, but I think in the context, if there is to be a peace agreement, uh, the ASEAN countries, particularly the Islamic ones, uh, the Islamic ones, and particularly Indonesia, have a potential role to play. Uh, but whether they have the capacity or interest, I'll have to leave that to others who would know the issue better better than I do. In terms of uh, Taliban, the integration of the Taliban military, that's an issue that has been discussed. Whether the Taliban military, or Taliban fighters, could be integrated into the current Afghan National Security Forces, or whether uh, the, there would be some other. Uh, approach, uh, looking at uh, examples such as Nepal, um, uh, for example, uh, and looking at some of the difficulties that uh, Nepal has had in integrating uh, formerly, former insurgent forces in. There's been discussion about that, but no really effective planning yet, uh, no, no effective planning uh, yet that I would say. And on the issue of the role of Pakistan, I think maybe we just have to d disagree on that and maybe have a, a longer discussion later over a cup of tea or something. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Sonia? I would actually uh, respond to the integration of Taliban into the uh, military. Um, there were two things which was actually interesting. One, a statement by Stan Ikzai, which uh, after uh, a f uh, you know a week or something he corrected it, but um, he said that you know when when there would be a peace process, there wouldn't be any need for war anymore. So. Yeah, San Jose is representing the Taliban. Uh, he said uh, perhaps we have to just dismantle the the army because we don't need them anymore. I mean, they were fighting us. Now we're coming back. So who are they going to fight? Um, so so I'm not sure if we're quite sure of the intentions, despite the fact that that statement was corrected. But still, I don't think uh, we're quite sure of the intentions. And uh, a historical uh, lesson, actually, um, 
Um, a very respectable friend of mine from the former Mujahideen once said that one of the biggest mistakes that we made was uh, after uh, after coming to Kabul was dismantling the, the army and the system that there was already and that was also a suggestion by, by Pakistan to them that you know they're not going to be loyal to you so get rid of them. Unfortunately, that uh, was one of the biggest mistakes that, that was made because to this day we haven't been able to actually establish a, a system that would match uh, that, uh, that management of, of military at that point. So um, it, it, it's, it's still very early for us to actually be able to, uh, to uh, talk about that. Uh, we still have a long way to, to sit with the Taliban and, and hear, uh, first of all, see the capacity. And um, the militias are not going to be able to manage an army. They have been militias. Uh, and there's all issues, uh, uh, I mean, war crimes and everything, but, but uh, I think we're, it's, it's still way too early and idealistic if we thought that we would be able to incorporate the Taliban into the military. Thanks, Bill. Just a couple of points. On the issue of closing the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, how one keeps it open for refugee returnees but uh, blocks it for extremists <coughs> crossing the border, um, historically uh, managed repatriations of refugees have involved the distribution of packages of assistance to people returning through the auspices of UNHCR. Uh, and if that were to take place, it would be relatively straightforward to locate the distribution of those packages at uh, particular crossing points uh, into Afghanistan, uh, which could be better monitored than uh, the mountain passes through which uh, the Taliban tend to move, although often they go through um, open borders without being obstructed by the, the Pakistan forces. Uh, and uh, that brings me to uh, the second point, which is sanctuaries within Pakistan. It is the case that Pakistan can't control the behaviour of the Taliban on a day-to-day -day basis. That also was the case in the late 1990s, as one saw when things like the destruction of the Buddhists in Bamiyan in 2001 uh, proved to be very embarrassing for Pakistan at the time. Pakistan does, however, have the capacity to uh, inflict enormous damage on the continued operations of the Taliban, either through sweeping up its leadership, which it could do in a matter of hours, or by moving against the sanctuaries, which uh, the location of which are known with precision to senior figures within the Inter-Services Intelligence Directorate. I once found myself at a wedding in Islamabad, sitting next to the former head of the India section of ISI, who spilt the beans in great detail to me about the way in which Pakistan had been supporting the Taliban uh, with chapter and verse supplied. Um, of course, it, it, it has a tiger by the tail to some degree, but that was always the case. Uh, just finally on the point of the character of the mainstream in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm not sure that the mainstream in Afghanistan is now own fragile. I think there's actually a broad mainstream in Afghanistan which um, is broadly supportive of the character of transition which has occurred in Afghanistan since 2001, with a lot of disappointment about failure to live up to expectations, but nonetheless an understanding that Afghanistan has benefited from being part of a globalised world. And this is something which will not easily be wound back, although I'm not persuaded that it's necessarily um, a fully effective protection against the return of a very brutal ra ruling regime. But there's one piece of data that I'd share in this respect, which I think is instructive when we're thinking about the alleged representativeness of the Taliban in a negotiation process. The latest survey conducted by the Asia Foundation, which is probably the best measure we have of opinion in Afghanistan, it's not perfect, but it's certainly better than chatter from the bazaar, uh, well, tells us that 82% of respondents had no sympathy whatsoever for the Taliban. 82% of respondents. So claims that the Taliban, for example, represent the Pashtun ethnic group simply because the Taliban are overwhelmingly Pashtun need to be very carefully qualified by reference to data of those kind which suggests that uh, the Taliban are actually, in terms of the assessment of the bulk of the Afghan population, the broad mainstream, a fringe did you have the last word? Uh, yes. uh, well, I think the, um, the questions were uh, uh, aptly uh, addressed, most of them. Um, 
I just wanted to uh, to, uh, to say about ASEAN's uh, specific countries' role in Afghanistan. Um, I concur what uh, David said that uh, there could be role uh, for uh, for different countries in this region for a post peace. Uh, 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 cooperation, uh, both in terms of you know Indonesia or Malaysia, contributing potentially to some sort of uh, you know a peacekeeping force, uh, but at the same time you know we already are trying to learn from the uh, uh, lessons uh, that Indonesia had. But of course context is different; there was uh, a different situation, but still Indonesia has been very helpful uh, in terms of uh, 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 their support. Uh, even offering a venue for negotiation with Taliban, holding an international ulama conference. Uh, when it comes to Singapore, of course, our president, I think, loves Singapore and you know, one of the models that he always mentions you know, in his book and the way that, you know, the efficient system that Singapore has. But again, uh, we bear in mind that uh, this Singapore and Afghanistan has, uh, I think, lots of divergence and differences. I think, uh, but but then uh, we are sending our civil servants even right now here for training, and especially the younger generation. I think that's a value add uh, that 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 Singapore could continue uh, offering with the help of other countries. On uh, on, I think the the point which was raised by uh, by Amin that was very uh, interesting. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, by uh, on the closing borders, but. Bill has mentioned that you know the role of the military has also been addressed, but uh, but what Bassett said about you know political uh, uh, and emotional differences, um, yes, I think that's true. There is uh, uh, these disagreements. Uh, the, uh, the emotions are very high, and on either side, uh, every side think that they are right, and and they're uh, they've been devoured. The victims, uh, a question of legitimacy. Taliban still uh, believe, um, I think, wrongly that you know they still uh, has the Islamic Emirate and that's been overthrown by the Americans and they need to restore it. And we believe that we have a constitutional democracy and you know they have been part of the uh, uh, the state, the, the nation state system for the past 18 years at least. So we have we are on the right path. But the 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 whole process of negotiation is that how we can coordinate and how we can bring these different emotions and you know, political understanding of, of Afghanistan together and create enough space for everyone, for all these emotions and you know, political ideas to come together and to find a place for themselves to live uh, you know, in harmony. Can we do something you know, within this changing the political structure or you know, the governance structure in a way that there will be place for different you know uh, attitudes ideas emotionals and way of looking into the governance coming into a uh, whole one system because at the end of the day the Taliban also uh, wants you know in Afghanistan and this is what they are stating a, a, a country which will be in peace you know in harmony economic development and this is also what uh, what you know we wanted but the differences on on the interpretation of things so if we can discount that part the Taliban are uh, ideologically so zealot that they will not be you know amenable to any change I mean that's of course this one one assumption which should be tested through this uh, 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 negotiations so I think we we have an opportunity to create a system which can accommodate a system accommodative system where you know different ideas and different mentalities as long as you know it, it is in the confines of what is understandable at you know the larger UN Charter uh, framework uh, could be accommodated. I think with this, uh, uh, I can you know conclude. And one thing on the on the sanctuaries, I still you know uh, don't believe that that we should discount this question of sanctuaries. Yes, right now maybe the sanctuaries has been diversified a little bit, but not seriously. There is no Kuwait Shura or or Miran Shah or this somewhere else. But I'll give you one example and I'll finish with this. Uh, 1993, uh, four up to five, Tajikistan had a very serious insurgency going on in that country. And the sanctuaries of the so-called Mujahideen of Tajikistan were northern Afghanistan. They were speaking the same language. They are the same sort of co-ethnics. And since in Kabul there was a government of Mujahideen, you know, President Rabani, Masood, and the others, they had emotional connections. Also with the uh, with the Tajik Mujahideen because they are fighting a communist uh, government, led government. But then at one point there was an agreement between the president of Tajikistan 
and the President of Afghanistan, which was controlling not all of the country, to dismantle the sanctuaries. And that weak government in Kabul managed to dismantle all the sanctuaries of Tajik resistance forces inside Afghanistan, and that's why we have a successful peace process. So even if, if there is political will, and I've said this many times to my Pakistani friends and counterparts, that look, this, there is an example. The minute all those sanctuaries were dismantled, the minute all the Tajik uh, refugees and also the uh, insurgents were asked to leave Afghanistan, or some of them were actually apprehended, arrested, and then the Dover, unfortunately, some of them were killed. Uh, the, 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 the prospect of peace and peace agreement and a, and a coalition government in, in Tajikistan materialized, and today we don't have you know, a war, and Tajikistan is considered as a success peace uh, 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 example. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, we've covered a lot of ground. A lot of issues have been raised. But we're also out of time. I think it's almost uh, 20 minutes, uh, we, but we started a few minutes early. So let me just say three things uh, at, the, at the end of this, I mean, of, of this fascinating discussion. One, whether we're optimists or pessimists, we've got to be prepared for change in Afghanistan. Change is inevitable uh, because of all the factors that we've talked about. We don't know what the outcome might look like, uh, whether it's not going to be 2001, certainly. It's not going to be 96, 98. It's not going to be 1992. That how the structure, is, so it's not about a, a theory of process or, or a procedure, but how the structural changes that have taken place will arrange themselves uh, in a new situation. So change. Second, I think, uh, one of you said, the panelists, uh, peace is not a, you know, is not a one-shot event. I want to apply that to for the Institute of South Asian Studies, so those of us who are focused on South Asia. This initiative that we're doing on Afghanistan, uh, it can't be a one-shot initiative for us because Afghanistan historically has been the agent of change in South Asia. I mean, you know, the famous historian K. Panikar, a strategist, uh, talked about whatever happened in Kabul Valley uh, affected what happened in the Indo-Gangetic Plain. That is, the dynamics in Northwest Frontier and Afghanistan had a profound impact on how the subcontinent itself was arranged. So our focus of study, which is the subcontinent, that will depend crucially, and I think uh, I've seen in the last 40 years of this war, how much the rest of the region has changed because of the unending war in Afghanistan, of jihad, of the rise of uh, you know, religion as a force multiplier the backlash to one kind of religion from another religion. So I think this is going to be an endemic, long-term challenge for us. Therefore, the rest of South Asia is a huge stake, actually, a lot more than the Americans who are running our patients, the Europeans who saw it as an alliance management problem uh, for the Great War on Terror. Beyond all that, uh, the South Asia has a stake. And within South Asia, that the war, the spoils, you know, it's always said the victor gets the spoils, but the spoils also get the victor. That already the transformation of the Northwest Frontier, uh, the transformation of Pakistan, what was seen as the most advanced state in South Asia, today has fallen behind Bangladesh. So the kind of uh, policies that you've pursued, that they've had an effect on the regional distribution of power in a strange way. So I think we're going to, for us in ISAS, this studying Afghanistan, uh, is going to be a, a continuing process, and I think we've not devoted enough attention. So I really want to thank uh, the three governments, as well as Rani, uh, who's here on a visiting fellowship, for organizing this, and we hope that we can continue this. And lastly, this is not just about South Asia, this is also about Singapore and Indonesia and Southeast Asia. I think I'm glad Mustafa raised that question. The idea that somehow South Asia is a backwaters, that while ASEAN had progressed, I think that image uh, is already it's not what ASEAN can do for peace in Afghanistan. There's also the reverse question. How does ASEAN secure itself against the negative trends that have fanned out of, out of Afghanistan and South Asia? That is as much of an important question. Therefore, this idea that somehow you can think of South Asia and Southeast Asia as different, or as Middle East and South Asia as different, I think it's important to begin to see this region in a more integrated manner. And therefore, I think the stakes of all the Everton regions, you mentioned Central Asia. The Gulf today, Mr. Khalilzad spends more time in Qatar than in Brussels, uh, tells you something, what's happening, that the Middle East is going to be very important for this, for South Asia, for Southeast Asia. So I would say that for Southeast Asia, because we're an institution located in, in Singapore, 
Uh, for us, I think for our stakeholders here too, what happens in Afghanistan uh, is quite important. Therefore, uh, we hope that to continue this uh, uh, engagement with the challenges of Afghanistan. And I want to thank the three governments again uh, for supporting us here. And also the panelists, please join me in thanking our panelists for posing the issues in such sharp Thank you, Chairperson, and our um, panelists for the interesting and insightful discussion. With that, we have come to the end of the ISAS panel discussion. Uh, thank you for, join, uh, for joining us at the event, and we look forward to seeing you at upcoming ISAS events. May the speakers um, stay back on stage for a group photo. And uh, please join us after this for a tea reception at the back. Thank you, and have a good evening.